Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Diego, UUFSD. My name is Chris Burns and I will be your worship associate today. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this space and some of us are bringing our struggling selves, including pieces we might be ashamed of. All of us are welcome here and all of us are loved. Some of us already have open hearts and some of us aren't quite there yet because our hearts have gotten a little beat up this week and might have forgotten how to trust and open. Your heart is welcome here no matter how bruised. We welcome you among us. All of us are imperfect, but we're here to drop our defenses and trust that what happens in worship is powerful and life-giving. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser than when we woke up this morning. We welcome you here. If you have your own chalice or candle at home, have it handy so we can all light our chalices together at the appropriate time. We are an active congregation, and there are many ways to keep informed. Our newsletter, our website, the bulletin board, and the weekly order of service announcements. If you wish to know more about this UU Fellowship, we encourage you, especially if you're a visitor, to go to our website at uufsd.org, where you'll find information about what is happening in our fellowship, the many ways you can become involved, find contact information to learn more, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. If you would like to, you can place your name and email address in the Zoom chat box labeled UUFSD. We will be happy to contact you. If you're visiting today, please join us for a virtual coffee hour after the service when we meet in breakout rooms, and then identify yourself as a visitor so we can be sure to welcome you and answer any questions you might have about our fellowship. Today I have three announcements. First, immediately following today's service, we'll be giving, providing information on the goals of our pledge drive. It's a short presentation. Please plan to stay for the 10 minutes. We will then go into the breakout rooms and have our virtual coffee hour. Second, Coffee Chat with Rev. Joe is this Wednesday, March 31st at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Join Rev. Joe monthly to chat about the theme of the month, its wisdom this month, or any other topic you may wish. Zoom information is in the weekly newsletter and the order of service. Third, this spring, Rev. Joe will be holding the Preacher Within You class, which will prepare you to lead a service in the future for this congregation, or at least understand what goes into a service. Registration closes next Friday. Again, details are in the weekly newsletter or the order of service. This church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. If you wish to offer your contribution during our service today or afterwards, please go to the UUFSD website and click on the Giving tab. This slide will be shown again at the end of the service. Thank you. I can't tell if the slide is actually showing. For some reason, I'm not getting the, um, the full screen images. Zoom hiccuped just as we started the service. <laughs> we come together to reaffirm our commitment to this community and to our UU principles that guide us in living a moral and ethical life. Welcome. We're glad you're all here today. We begin the service with the hymn, Go Down Moses. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rabbi Deborah Marcus from Temple Emanuel of San Diego. And I'm Rabbi Ben Shree. We want to wish everyone at the UU Fellowship a happy Passover. We're happy that we have this opportunity to share with you in your recognition, in your acknowledgement of our Passover holiday. Passover is a little bit ironic because on Passover, we wish each other, in Yiddish, we say, is a Pesach? We say, Chag Sameach. We wish each other a happy festival, a sweet festival, and a joyful festival. And at the same time, we use this holiday not only to remember and celebrate our exodus from 
degradation from slavery in Egypt to freedom, but we also use it as a deep and sacred call to remember the other tragedies happening in the world and as a reminder to all of us that we are all obligated as free people to be God's partners in this world and to liberate those who are still oppressed today, to help set free those who are still degraded today. And so we think with sadness about the many situations of difficulty, conflict, and strife around the world. And at the same time, we immerse ourselves in happiness so that we remind ourselves what we're fighting for and so that we remind ourselves how important it is to be God's partners so that we can bring others who are in sadness now to the place of happiness that we are in. With that in mind, our gathering hymn this morning is Go Down Moses. Please join us in singing. Our vaccinated team to your congregation have a zis in a Pesach. Good morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Joe Green, your minister here at the UUFSD. I feel privileged to be with all of you this morning. I'm also thankful to be joined by Chris Burns as worship associate. You saw Marshall Voigt, our music director, and Katie Cleric, our pianist. And a big, big thank you to the rabbis Devorah Marcus and Ben Shree from Temple Emmanuel and Marshall for doing our gathering hymn. And soon you will see Allison ALG McLeod, our DRE, who you will see later in our intergenerational sharing. These last couple of weeks have been exhaustingly horrific. Five days after the shooting of innocent Asian women in Atlanta, more innocent people died in a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Places we go to on a regular basis now have become fearful, dangerous places. Gun violence is its own pandemic and something we need to fight against. It doesn't seem to be important until it is. Some statistics show that even the pandemic didn't really stop the occurrences of gun violence, even though for a while we thought it did. I offer you this morning an affirmation of hope. 
a place we can aspire to, a place that one day we will live into. Affirmation of Hope by Loretta Williams. We bearers of the dream affirm that a new vision of hope is emerging. We pledge to work for that community in which justice will be actively present. We affirm that there is struggle yet ahead. Yet we know that in the struggle is the hope for the future. We affirm that we are co-creators of the future, not passive pawns. And we stand united in affirmation of our hope and vision of a just and inclusive society. We affirm the unity of all persons. We affirm siblinghood that allows us to touch upon each other's humanity. We affirm a unity that opens our eyes, ears, and hearts to see the different but common forms of oppression, suffering, and pain. Yet we are one in the image of God and we celebrate our hopes for human unity. Within ourselves and within the gathered community, we will discover the strength not to hide in indifference. Affirming that hope publicly expressed energizes and enables us to move forward. Together we pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. We pledge to make our tomorrows become our todays. May it be so. Blessed be. We take a moment now to honor those First Nations who had held this land before we appropriated it. I will light this candle for the Kumyai Nation and Luiseno Nation, whose land we now occupy. We honor the 18 tribes and bands of Kumyai and Luiseno nations here in San Diego County. We acknowledge our complicity as a nation in the near genocide of these nations, strive to dismantle the colonial systems that act as barriers to justice for indigenous people, both in the present and the future. We bring our hope and vision each day to inspire us to be that congregation of open minds, helping hands, and loving hearts. Amen. Plato quotes Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher and teacher, as saying, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the more recent uh, German philosopher, said, the further knowledge advances, the nearer we come to the unfathomable. The Unitarian Universalist Flaming Chalice represents our shared history, hope, and commitment to the principles of our faith that joins us together. You are now invited to join me in lighting a chalice or candle, holding it up to your camera, so we can share our light together. It's lit, it's just faint. Please join in singing our centering hymn, Spirit of Life, followed by reciting our covenant, 
The words to both will appear on your screen. Please join me in reciting the Fellowship Covenant. May love be the spirit of this congregation. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our covenant. Good morning, everyone. Today's book is called is around Anne Frank and it is called Anne Frank and the Remembering Tree by Sandy Sesso and it's illustrated by Erica Streisical. I was planted in the heart of Amsterdam, a city of skinny streets of canals and bridges. I could see the tall bell tower of the church in the distance I looked over the buildings and watched people on their bicycles. Children in the houses around the courtyard picked my chestnuts when they fell to the ground in autumn. I liked it when the children used my chestnuts to make puppets and play games, and I loved to hear them laugh. Smiles and laughter were like sunshine and rain that helped me grow. One day, people along the canals of Amsterdam stopped smiling and laughing. There were German soldiers everywhere. I heard people call them Nazis. The Nazis hated anyone who was not like them, especially the Jewish people. They wanted to get rid of all the Jews in Europe, and I didn't understand why anybody would want to do this, but I was just a tree. I did not like the sound of black boots marching on the cobblestone sidewalks, the sirens or the shouting in the streets. Why wouldn't people who like different kinds of trees and flowers also like many different kinds of people? It made no sense to me but I was just a tree. I had always looked into the windows of houses around the courtyards. In most windows, I saw people working and children playing. When the soldiers came, people began covering their windows so I couldn't see anymore. But the tiny attic window of the narrow brick house behind Otto Frank's business offices had no window shade. And for a long time, the rooms were empty. Then one day, Otto's whole family came to live there. They called their new home the Secret Annex. The Franks were Jews. They were hiding from the Nazis before long four other people joined them. I couldn't understand how eight people could live in such a small place, but I was a tree. At certain times, all eight people would gather around a small radio to listen to the news about the war. I liked to watch Otto's daughter. The oldest one was Margaret. She was 16, Anne was 13. And both sisters loved to write in their diaries about what was happening and how they were feeling. Margaret was very shy and very quiet. 
and she never let me see what she wrote. Anne would climb up to the attic, sit on a wooden crate and listen to the church bells chime. Because I looked into the window, I could see Anne writing in a red and white check diary. She was writing about me. She wrote that as long as she could see blue sky and clouds and me, she could be happy. And her words made me so happy too. Anne described the ways I changed through the seasons, my white flowers in the spring, my dark green leaves in summer and my chestnuts in autumn. She even marveled at how the rain froze like diamonds on my winter branches. Anne, Margaret, come out to play. I called at them through my attic window. Come sit in the shade, pick my chestnuts and play games. Even, even though I was just a tree, I knew they couldn't. I knew they were afraid. Sometimes Anne and Margaret would climb up the attic to get away from all the adults. They would read books and look at the attic window to see all the rooftops of all the houses in the bell tower. And often they laughed. Why are you laughing? I asked, what are you thinking? And Anne and Margaret answered me by writing in their diaries. Being a tree doesn't stop you from feeling what people feel. And when someone loves you, you know it and it helps you grow. The girls kept growing too. Sometimes at twilight, they would come to the attic and speak softly to each other. I wanted to hear what they were saying, but even though I was just a tree, I understood that their words were just meant for each other. Then one day in late summer, the Franks heard heavy footsteps and a group of Nazi soldiers burst into the room. They made everyone in the secret annex go with them, including Anne and Margaret. Don't leave, I called after them. Come outside, I will hide you in my branches. But Anne and Margaret couldn't hear. The shouting of the soldiers was too loud. For many days and nights, I kept looking in the window, hoping that Anne and Margaret would return, but they never did. Several years later, Otto Frank came back alone. Where are Anne and Margaret? I asked. But only children can understand the language of the trees. Then a good friend who had helped the Franks when they lived in the secret annex gave Otto, Anne's diary. I saved it, hoping one day that she would come back, she said. Otto held the red and white checkered book in his hands. And Margaret's? he asked. She lowered her eyes. We never found it. Years passed. Winters, springs, summers, and falls. I missed Anne and Margaret and their dreams. Margaret had wanted to be a nurse to bring new babies into the world. Anne wanted to be a writer. Before long, people were reading Anne's diary and coming to look at me. They came to see the tree she saw from the window of the secret annex. I was just a tree, but Anne had made me famous. I was glad people remembered Anne and Margaret when they saw me. Even though people cared for me, eventually I became sick. They put metal beams around me so I could stand. And then one day a big storm blew by so hard that I broke. I was 170 years old. I couldn't stand anymore. People took pieces from my branches to grow into new little trees called saplings. One day those saplings will be over a hundred feet tall. I was just one tree, but now I am many. People planted my saplings in places around the world as reminders of what happened to Anne and Margaret and what hatred can do. They planted them so everywhere adults and children would recall the hope and promise of two young girls who loved a tree and the tree that remembered them. Thank you, Allison. What a moving story. What a moving story. We now come to the element in our service where we share our joys, sorrows, concerns, and transitions. What we will do this morning is we'll have some music playing in the background. We will open the chat box up and you will be able to write into the chat box whatever the joy, sorrow, transition, or concern that you may have. And then I will read those after we're through and Chris will drop a stone into water to signify that we are sharing with you whatever that joy or sorrow is. We will now begin the music for time for reflection.
Betsy writes, yesterday we went on an outing with fellowship friends. It was so nice to be together and learn all about growing beans. Angie writes that Ed was admitted to the hospital Friday, small bowel obstruction. If it doesn't resolve by tomorrow, surgery will follow. Please keep him in your thoughts and we will. Ron Demuth, I think you wrote a haiku. Spring joy, flutteringly floating in the breeze, a single butterfly. Rich writes, so sorry, Angie, give Ed our love. And Mary Ann writes, so sorry, Angel, Angie, we'll keep Ed in my heart. Tracy writes, much love to Ed. Linda and Ted write, we had a wonderful time at the Rio Del Rey Heirloom Bean Farm yesterday <laughs> and learned about sustainable foods and much more. And Barbara writes, hoping for a swift resolution for Ed. We all keep Ed in our hearts and prayers. Although we aren't physically together, our pastoral care team is still here for you. So if you are in need of pastoral care, please email pastoralcare at uufsd.org and you can give your contact information or state what your needs are if you are comfortable, which will help them respond more quickly. Spirit of life, spirit of love, God of many names or none. We gather this morning during this tumultuous time with hope, hope that the vaccine is giving so many of us, hope that maybe, just maybe this time, there will become gun legislation that will help to save people from being killed. We share our joys and sorrows and concerns together. All the birthdays and anniversaries that may not have been mentioned, all the sickness that people are experiencing and maybe loss of life that were not expressed. We share those with all of you. We are here together to share. That's why we come together. And may we say prayers and think good thoughts for Ed and all others who may be experiencing sickness or disease. For those who might be experiencing cancer treatments, we are here. We can help you, whatever it is you need. Amen, Ashe, blessed be. And now let us enter into a time of silence for meditation, reflection or prayer, depending on your practice. We will first sing meditation on breathing and this time of silence will, will be next and that will end with the sound of a bell.
Our reading today is a little unusual, and uh, I think I've got Zoom back working again. Um, it's from It's Okay to Be Okay, How to Stop Feeling Survivor Guilt During COVID-19, written by Aaron Smith. The term survivor guilt is usually used to describe the emotional distress that some people feel after su surviving a traumatic event in which others have died, such as a natural disaster or terrorist attack. It has been identified in military veterans, those who survived the Holocaust, 9-11 survivors, and emergency first responders. COVID-19 has certainly been a traumatic experience and has had a profound impact on mental health. During COVID-19, we've witnessed the conventional type of survivor guilt associated with surviving the coronavirus when hundreds of thousands haven't, but not everyone is struggling. And this has resulted in a new type of survivor guilt. This emerging type of guilt is characterized by not feeling impacted enough by the pandemic. This type of survivor guilt can be seen in the workplace. The pandemic has forced many organizations to reduce staffing, causing some remaining employees to feel guilty, according to John Haxton, who is the head of thought leadership at the Myers-Briggs Company. Survivor guilt can result in a range of emotions, from shame to a sense of unworthiness, or even anger. When emotions are not processed properly, they can impact our physical and mental health and cause depression, anxiety, and physical illness. On a personal note, I worked in a highly dynamic industry for many years. The companies I worked for grew explosively and shrank in stages, and survivor guilt was a major management concern following each round of layoffs. Thank you, Chris. The story of Passover in shortened form goes back 3000 years ago, recounting the plight of the Israelites as they were bound into slavery by the Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians. Moses asked countless times of the Pharaoh to release his people and the Pharaoh continued to refuse. So with God's help, Moses rained down a series of 10 plagues on the Egyptians which included turning the water in the river Nile into blood, raining infestations at various times of frogs, lice, locusts, or flies down on the Egyptians, creating boils on all that came into contact with the dust that Moses threw to no avail. Each time the Pharaoh would relent, but then after the plague subsided, would renege on his agreement. It finally culminated with an angel coming down one night to kill the firstborn son of all who did not protect themselves by marking lamb's blood above their doors in order to show the angel of death to pass them by. It is described in the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 27. You shall say it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshiped. Hence it is called Passover or Pesach in Hebrew as those who are spared honor and are grateful ever since to have been passed over by the angel of death. This is one of the sacred holy times of Judaism, last night being the first night of Passover and one of the most important. Last night, many in the Jewish religion celebrated their Seder dinner, read the story called the Haggadah that is considered a mitzvah to tell your children, and recount the story in the book of Exodus as it is written in there. The next sacred night is the eighth night, the last night which this year also is the same day as Easter in the Christian religion. Historians say that the Last Supper of Jesus was purposely chosen by him as his Last Supper 
to coincide with the last night of Passover. Christians mark the Thursday before Easter as Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, as the night of his Last Supper. Professor Colin Humphreys of Cambridge University has researched and discovered what he believes to be that night of the Last Supper as April 1st, 33 Common Era, which would have been a Wednesday. And that if we wanted consistency, we could use the first Sunday of April every year as Easter. Both Passover and Easter are determined by the lunar calendar, and that is why every year it is a different date. I am sure that if we were not in a pandemic, our congregation would have held a Seder dinner. I have heard that you have in the past, but it is difficult to do over Zoom. I am hoping that next year we will be back on track and can once again celebrate with our Jewish members here a day that is so sacred to them. Tikkun is a Jewish magazine that I read periodically. When I lived in Los Angeles before going to seminary, I worked at a reformed Jewish temple and learned much about the Jewish traditions just by being there on a daily basis. Estelle Frankel, a psychotherapist and Jewish spiritual advisor, wrote an article a couple of years ago that sparked an interest in me. In this article, she writes about the wisdom of not knowing. I remember thinking, how can there be wisdom when you don't know something? That seems more like ignorance to me. <laughs> she quotes Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, who spoke about the infinite nature of the divine. And she spoke of God and humans belief systems, and how Rebbe Nachman stated that it was impossible to know God with only our minds, that we don't have any idea of our ignorance. We don't know what we don't know, that we cannot realize all that we don't know and how much ignorance we really have. And he, Rebbe, drew upon the Torah and the human soul to show we can express who our divine creator is through those means and that we must have humility to access that wisdom. Who knows what happened 3000 years ago? Could the Nile River actually be turned into blood to release the Jewish slaves? It is plausible that the plagues of insects and animals could have occurred. Science could probably show that. But the angel of death, could that really have happened? If we are to have humility, we'd have to say, no one really knows. That is the ignorance that we have. We can say it's impossible if we aren't believers. And we can say that it is most certainly happened if we are believers. It is in the not knowing while holding humility that can be the hardest for us humans. I want to say that's impossible. I mean, locusts and flies, maybe. But the rest of it, no way. And yet there are those of us who believe that all that is written in the Torah and the Bible have truly come to pass. Without humility, however, according to Estelle Frankel, we cannot learn and grow. We cannot take in information until we accept that we maybe, just maybe, don't know. That happened last year with the COVID-19 virus. I believe, I believe we had our own Passover globally with this virus that has encompassed the world. But I don't know what protected some and infected others. Did the angel of death come down and choose who would get sick or who would die? What was the common denominator? It wasn't just the firstborn son. And yet it was a plague. 
It was disease we knew hardly anything about and had to determine over the past year how to combat it. Our scientists around the world took all the knowledge that they had to determine how we could fight it and protect people and keep them from dying. They began with saying, we don't know what we don't know. They began with wisdom and humility. I don't gather from the Exodus story that there was survivor guilt, as Chris read earlier. If they did what they were told and believed, believed, they were protected and then they were saved. Did we do that this past year? Did we have those who believed and protected themselves, wore masks, stayed home alone, stayed more than six foot, feet away from other human beings, didn't travel, didn't even leave the house in some instances, and had the humility to say, I don't know what I don't know, so I'm going to err on the side of the experts. Moses was the expert back then, and people listened to him. Our experts last year were kind of pushed to the background in some instances, and many didn't listen to them anyway. So we have had to date almost 550,000 deaths from this virus in our country alone, almost 3 million worldwide. Who was chosen to catch it and who wasn't? There really wasn't any rhyme or reason in many instances. I was careful. I stayed home most of the time. I always wore a mask. I still haven't hugged anyone. But I still could have caught it and I didn't. I was passed over. And now I've had my vaccinations and know that at least I believe I won't die from it, even if I catch it later. That's my belief that I want to stick with anyway. But what about those who didn't take precautions? I watched on the news those patients who said, I thought it was a hoax, were then put on a ventilator and later died. And I watched those on TV who refused to wear a mask, who ridiculed those who did, who got so angry for someone saying they had to have a mask on to shop that they would then destroy merchandise on their way out with their anger. And they never got sick. There was an orderly fashion that the angel of death had, the firstborn son, period. There wasn't any order to this. People who were certain to catch it or die from it never did. Those you least expected to become gravely ill, many younger persons who felt invincible, they succumbed to this virus. In the reading Chris read earlier, it said, but not everyone is struggling And this has resulted in a new type of survivor guilt. This emerging type of guilt is characterized by not feeling impacted enough by the pandemic. I felt that. I've been working throughout this last year for this congregation and the one before. I didn't stop working. In fact, I'm working more hours per week than I have before. And I've been getting paid the whole time. So I'm trying to give any spare money I have to causes that need it, to help people to eat, to have food, to help delivery people who are still trying to work to survive, to shop at small businesses, to help in any way I can to keep them afloat. Because I feel guilty sometimes that I'm not suffering. So many people right now are suffering. I mean, suffering. Children are hungry 
and not having food because their parents can't afford to buy them any. Senior citizens who are homebound and relying on others to deliver everything to them are suffering with lack of money, with lack of resources, with fear of going outside. Depression is up, suicide is up, anxiety disorders are up. I actually haven't had any of those. And that makes me feel guilty. (laughs) I go to bed every night thanking the universe and my version of God for all that I have. And I still feel like I haven't done enough when I see how others are suffering. We must acknowledge our good fortune when we have it. We must have the humility to know that we don't know everything. We must recognize when we have been spared and take on those extra duties or responsibilities to help those who can't help themselves right now. If we have enough, then we need to give more. I was grateful to receive a check from President Biden last week, and I gave it to Feed America. I don't want someone to go hungry. I don't want someone to be evicted. I've been passed over and I am fortunate. Marshall relayed a story to me about our gathering him, Go Down Moses. There was an argument between Jewish people and black people about whose song this really was. The Black people claimed it because it was one of their slave songs. They sang it in the fields as they were toiling, and it gave them hope that they would be saved. And the Jewish people said, no, it's our song. We had Moses take us to the promised land. They both said it was their song. And it is. For people of color right now are still in many ways enslaved in this country. We have created laws and customs that have kept black people poor, unable to vote, unable to own property. Both have been slaves in the past. I am heartened though, as I heard last night on the news that the city of Evanston, Illinois passed legislation to give reparations in the amount of $25,000 to help buy homes for Black families. They won't get money in their pockets, per se. They will get a credit on a down payment, or if they already own a home, they will receive credit for repairing or renovating their homes. It's a start, and hopefully will be a model for other cities to copy. And as one Black resident said, At least it will help to be able to pass something down to our children. We never, we may never have a federal law offering reparations, but each city in this country can do it a little at a time. It's a start. People of color have been afflicted for centuries here and white people have been passed over. It is time to restructure that model. We are seeing a reduction in the amount of people contracting the virus and the numbers of people being vaccinated are growing at a wonderfully fast rate. I want to believe the worst is over. I want everyone to be passed over and know that isn't possible. What have we learned from this pandemic? Did we hold humility and wisdom together in our hands or did we hold arrogance and pride as most important? Sometimes it doesn't matter if we are right. What matters is what we believe, how we treat each other, what we question. Estelle Frankel talks about the sacred role of questioning in the Jewish tradition. 
On the first night of Passover, the youngest child present is asked to recite the four questions. In a shortened form, the four questions are, what do you carry with you and what are you too, too rushed to do? What is a challenge you faced last year and what was the greatest thing you learned from it? How do you remember the past and what are you doing to change the future? And lastly, what makes you feel comfortable? When are you free to relax? Questions we all can ask ourselves, especially this last year. May we go out into the world and be grateful that we have been spared. If we have not, if we lost loved ones, grieve that loss and know that we are all here grieving with you. This has been a year filled with turmoil, pain, suffering, and death. For those of us spared the suffering, spared the death, spared the pain, let us every day be grateful for all that we have. May it be so. Blessed be. And now our closing hymn. In Pennsylvania, Reverend Dan Schatz was my was in my chapter and he became known as the folk singing UU minister, always adding a wonderfully spiritual element to our chapter services. He wrote and is performing our closing hymn called Carry the Flame. Please enjoy this very special message. Never knew the only thing that you could do was carry the flame, sickness spreading through the land. You held your spirit in your hands and carried the flame. When storms and sorrows gathered round You raised your head and you stayed your ground You carried the flame Endless days of the hardest living You kept on loving, kept on giving You kept on and carried the flame Raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow, carry the flame. And when the day is done at last, and we take on the spark you passed. And we send it on, the kindling hope of a rising dawn. In a song, we carry the flame. The flame, raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow.
nurses, doctors, teachers. We are children, parents, preachers, and we all carry the flame. We are scientists and cargo packers, farmers, singers, grocery stackers, young and old. We carry the flame. Carry the flame, raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow. Carry the flame. Let it glow, carry the flame. Please join me in the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As we said earlier, here's the address to give support for you UFSD. We invite you to listen to our postlude, after which there will be a short presentation, and then the chat function will be turned back on while the breakout rooms are being organized. Organized for us to join for a virtual coffee hour and connections. Dear beloved community, I am so grateful you are here. I am so grateful you were passed over and that you are still here. May we go out into the world and help those who can't help themselves right now. There are so many and there's so much that we can be doing. I am so grateful to see all your faces in your little squares out there. Can we somehow connect each other by holding on to the edges and know that one day soon, it's going to be soon, I just know it is, we're going to be together in person again. Let us be connected even virtually until we can stand shoulder to shoulder and side by side. We have weathered the worst part, I hope. God bless you all. Go in peace.
Go ahead, Richard. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard McDonald, and I'm the uh, chair of your stewardship committee. And as you may know, this is the time of year when we do our budget for next year. And the first step, the very first step in the budget process is to figure out what our income is going to be. And in order to do that, we do a pledge drive, ask people to remind us to um, how much they're pledging for the next fiscal year. Our pledge drive starts now and it runs through the month of April. So we will have three pledgers today, uh, three presenters today, I should say, and their pledgers too, I might add. Uh, but we have three presenters today. And the first one will be Sarah Miller, who will give us a financial plan. This is the numbers she shows you are not for next year because we haven't done the budget yet. That comes later. These is there are just numbers based on a standard budget from previous years. And then Jill Ballard will talk to you and remind you what our pledge dollars support. And then I will talk with you about how to actually make your pledge. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Sarah to do her section on the financial part. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, I'm gonna wanna share my screen. So Joe, I hope you've given me permission to do that. I think we um, can, what does it say? Yes, you, you, your co-host, you should have permission. Awesome, okay. But before I, I do that, I just want to uh, uh, emphasize what Rich just said. Uh, what I'm gonna show you is not the budget. Uh, my intention is just to educate you and give you some perspective on where we get our, our income from and how we spend it. And it's really just about the math. It's not about anything else. So with that preamble, let me bring up my screen. Um, Boy, I thought I had that all queued up. Hang on. There it is. No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Okay, I am now having trouble sharing my screen. Joe, can you help me out or whoever's running this? Um... Hi, it's Catherine, try again. Okay, clicking on share screen. There we go. And... Thanks for your patience, everybody. Okay. Um, so in terms of our expenses, uh, basically uh, this year we've, um, it costs us $340,000 to cover all of our personnel. That includes all the compensation for Rev Joe and Allison, Tracy, Marshall, Joe Cantrell, Katie, uh, the custodian, the payroll taxes, workers comp, everything. And that's what that costs. Then uh, it costs about $25,000 to run the office. That includes covering the bookkeeper, banking fees, uh, credit card fees, the copier, various supplies, subscription services, phone, internet, those sorts of things. Then it costs another $25,000 uh, for ops or grounds that includes the insurance, you know, liability and property insurance, utilities, uh, the building and grounds, um, maintenance budget, uh, payments on our solar loan, and all those things that have to do with the grounds. Uh, then it costs almost $25,000 uh, for us, uh, our fair share dues to UUA. And then uh, the Finance Committee has emphasized how important it is for us to be putting aside every year $25,000 for repair and replacement reserve. Uh, you may remember the problem we ran into last year when we had a, a water pipe leak and finding money to pay for that. So we really need to be putting this aside every year. So that um, 
uh, comes to a total of a budget of about 440,000. So if you put that in the mathematical perspective, we have a budget of 440,000 and about 220 members. So it costs UFSD about $2,000 per member to meet our financial obligations. So this is the budget again, and here's our income. This year, we're getting $340,000 in pledges. As you can see, that number exactly matches personnel. And that's pretty much the way it's been for the 10 years I've been a member here. Uh, additionally, this coming year, we'll get almost $50,000 from Sandy Hill. So that covers that, but that still leaves $50,000 gap between our guaranteed income and our known expenses. So the goal with this year's finance, uh, pledge is to close that gap. And the reason that's important is if we had enough guaranteed income to cover our costs, then we could make fewer asks for money every year. We wouldn't have to have to fundraise just to keep the doors open. We could do more things just for fun and not charge for them. And we could donate every Sunday collection to a meaningful cause. And um, that would be so much in line with our Unitarian values. And I, I just think that would be wonderful if we could get to that point. So again, just a math uh, discussion, just to put that gap into perspective, $50,000 increase would be a 15% increase in pledging. And we could achieve that by increase everyone increasing their pledge by 15%. Or again, just to give you some perspective on the, the kind of numbers we're talking about, as an equal share, if everyone gave $20 more a month, we would cover that gap completely. So that's the math. That's, that's, those are the numbers we're talking about. Um, and that's what I hope you'll take away. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks very much. Uh, Jill, do you um, want to come on and do your part? Yes. Uh, now, I'm Jill. Ready to do that. Good morning, everyone. I still see Rich on my screen, so <laughs> I'll just, okay, there we go. Great. I'm going to share my screen also and hope that it works. Uh, there you go. Great. So th this is from a brochure that you're all going to get in the mail. So you'll get to read it more thoroughly then. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what our pledges support. We, re we receive so much for, for what we give. And even though we can't be together in person, that there, there's still an awful lot going on. Our, our worship services are, are the centerpiece of, of life for, for fellowship life for, for many of us. And a lot goes on behind the scenes to, to make them happen. I, I missed, I think maybe three services in the past year because the services are my, my weekly opportunity to, to center myself on, on what's most important to me. And, and even though we aren't together physically, I, I feel the presence of, of all of you there. there. Our religious education program has been going really strong this year. Allison has been, been leading um, eight programs a week um, for, for children, youth, young adults, and they range from everything from storytelling to, to uh, the coming of age program is still going on and uh, social groups and, and discussion groups. Our social justice program has been um, very active. Look at all the programs that, that have been continuing this year. And I love this quote from, from Julia Darling, part of making changes is becoming uncomfortable with the status quo. It is nice to be in a safe space to really look at our culture and my upbringing in it. I can be part of a new awareness that helps me work toward changing the structural racism built into our society. 
And I also love this little poster with a child here, which I don't know if you can read, but it says, peace, love, never shut up. <laughs> Community building has probably been one of the more challenging things to to accomplish this past year but but um you can see we still have have groups that continue and, and i know for me i've been part of a women's group and the a meditation group and the band and those are the things that have kept me sane in, in this past year and I, I hope you all have found some activities to be a part of as well and our beautiful site, um, which I know we all miss so much, um, but we are very lucky to to have a, a buildings and ground work group that that has been been working very hard to keep our site ready for us when we can meet again, and hopefully that will be be very soon. And I'm going to turn it back to. Rich, if I can stop sharing my screen. <laughs> uh oh, oh, here, maybe I saw it. Stop. Okay. <laughs> to you. Thank you very much, Jill. <laughs> so, the last step, I'm just going to go over very quickly how to uh, make your pledge. And I just want to remind you that we're not starting from zero on the pledge drive. We're starting at $340,000 because we roll over all the pledges in the class automatically. And uh, if, as long as they've been paid in full for the previous year. So if you don't make any changes, if you don't go to the pledge uh, site that I'm going to show you and make a change, then your, we will assume your pledge will roll over and you will start getting emails with to that effect um, so it's really the fifty thousand dollars is what we're talking about in our goal and that's what you'll see in the thermometer that we present with you present to you so let me show you something you've probably seen many times this is the site is uufsd.org pledge and there's also a menu uh way to get there but this is the um giving guide that's put out by the UUA and it is progressive in the sense that the more money you uh, the more income you have the more that percentage wise that you will give to the fellowship and what's important to me and for this talk is to look at these number these names the labels supporter sustainer visionary transformer it's important i think for you to think about where you are on that on that list and where you want to be how much does the fellowship mean to you? How much do you get out of it? And then that will um, figure it, tell you what, where you end up on that list. There's another way of, another kind of giving guide that a, the uh, stewardship committee has looked at and a lot of people think it looks very good. You basically read these little blurbs and find out what kind of uh, family you are, young, old, with kids, kids in college or not. And it gives you an idea of what, to um, pledge based on that. And then here at the bottom is the link to actually the form to pledge. And there's another link if you wanna find out about volunteer opportunities at the fellowship. Christy Turner is the person to talk to. She's in charge of our leadership development. So let me just jump to the form. And it's very simple. It's a breeze form, so it all goes into breeze. First name, last name, your email, what your pledge is on an annual basis. And then we're asking you something new this year to think about what's your personal commitment to the fellowship. And I showed you those five things, or you can not, not decide not to declare it. But we want you to think about it in terms of time and treasure. Now, it's not just money, it's also the time that you put in. And I'll just give you an example. Louise Garrett, who you all know, who runs the lunch, uh, runs the kitchen, gives us lunch at all the services, runs the Thanksgiving dinner, uh, the pink flamingo swap sheet, uh, swap meet. Um, she is clearly a transformer in this fellowship, no matter what her pledge is. So I want you to think in those kind of terms when you fill this out. And it's really for your information. It's nothing, not anything that we will use. 
And then at the bottom, if you want to put in your payment details, if it's not coming in monthly, then uh, it's probably good to tell us when it is or what the what the format is that you're going to use. So that's basically the uh, the presentation. Rev. Joe is going to uh, give a few words at the end um, to uh, support us. Rev. Have to unmute myself. This is a wonderful community. I've been associated with a few different UU churches in the past, and this is a very giving community. And I want to acknowledge that and, and say how grateful I am for all that you do give, not just in money, like Rich said, you give your time and energy and commitment to this community. And I've always looked at a pledge as it's a spiritual practice because this is our spiritual home. So you want to take care of your home. And this is just part of, it's like, if you're at home and you need to clean the windows, you might not want to do it. You might pay someone to do it, but you've, you've got to have those funds to do that. And so this is, this is what we're kind of asking for this morning for the next year is we want, we want to make sure we have enough funds available to clean our windows, um, you know, sweep the grounds, pay the, pay the mortgage or whatever bills we have. I don't think we have a mortgage, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and keep that in mind that you're not just contributing for yourself, but you're contributing to the community that we're all in this together and that soon we will be in person. I'm just, I can feel it. <laughs> I'm hoping in the next couple of months, enough people will be vaccinated and the county guidelines, that's what we're going by. The county guidelines will say we can do that. So I know this is difficult to do over Zoom, that sometimes we don't feel as connected, but I can see all your little squares. And so I feel a little more connected seeing all of you together. So God bless you all for sustaining this community as you have. Blessed be. I don't know, Rich, what's next? Time for coffee. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> good. Um, I will create Drink the up. breakout rooms um, and we'll be ready to do that in just a moment unless there any anything else y'all want to say.